many, how many of you in here work uh, in your practice with your spouse? Anybody in here? Quite a few of you. One of the things that <laughs> you may have noticed that working together as a whole other set of stresses to the partnership besides just being in a romantic relationship. It's one of the things that we do in working with businesses. Often, the business people that we work with are couples who are in business together. Uh, and this education and these skills are critically important for their success for the reason that Lane just said, for the revisitation to power struggle once again. You know, this, these five stages are such an important key because if you don't know about these five stages and that they are predictable, it's very easy to jump to all kinds of inappropriate conclusions about what things mean and then make some rash choices or decisions or actions that are not founded in reality at all. But if you know about this, you know that if you deepen the commitment in your partnership, say you're dating and then you decide to move in together, or you've been living, you're married and then you decide to have children, or you decide to create a business together, that you will go back to power struggle, there will be some challenges, and that what it means is more trust is required. And a big part of that, one of the most important skills, is being able to make requests, not demands, requests, that inspire the cooperation of the person that you're making the request for. So you change your complaints into requests, and it creates a very different energy dynamic in the partnership. One of the things in romantic relationships that people are, are often blind to and will take as a criteria for love is, well, they'll just know what I want, and they'll just give it to me. That's how I know they love me. I don't have to ask them because they just know. That's a formula for disaster. So, yes. I was wondering if you could share any insights or if there's anything specifically you notice different about uh, when one of the partners has been sexually abused in the relationship. Is there anything that comes up regularly as a tappable issue that's different than uh, in, a, in a relationship where the two partners haven't been abused? Well, the most general one being trust, but uh, more specifically, um, that um, the abused person, it's very easy for them to make decisions that their needs aren't important, they're not as important as other people, that their needs are invisible. Um, and so sometimes it's very difficult for someone who's been uh, abused to feel they have the right to ask to take care of their own needs, to ask for what they want, because they, they have all this guilt that says that their needs aren't important and, and that they're it creates too much problem and they're a burden and so that issue um, that their needs aren't important that they, de they deserve to be used that they should keep their needs invisible that if they make their needs visible that that creates problems so um, a lot of tapping on, on being assertive and asking for what they want sometimes when you think well what if you felt completely safe and you knew that the answer would be yes what would you ask for? And the thought will come into their mind. And very quickly, the fear about asking gets quickened. And then you tap on that as the emotion comes up. And so as you tap and neutralize the fear about making that request, then it becomes, oh, ho, ho hum, pass the salt. I'd like a chocolate cupcake. I'd like it if you rub my back. I'd like it if you would um, talk to me more in the evening rather than watch the late night news. It becomes easy for them to make their request. And also helping the non-abused mate to uh, become more gentle, patient, understanding, and to, and to also help them in the bedroom in their sexual encounters to know that unresolved experiences from their sexual abuse may come up so that the, their sexual relationship can also become an arena for healing for both of them, really, but especially for the one who was abused. So it's working with, with both people, both partners. In fact, in that that's way. a real important key to our work because, because since our view is relationships are for learning, we also see that there's an equal learning opportunity in every relationship. It's not one-sided. The learning opportunities dovetail. 
And so though the abused person may have certain issues, the non-abused person's issues fit in very closely with that. And so when you see and you help illuminate how their learning opportunities fit together, it equalizes the power balance in the relationship because one of the things that can be very problematic is if all of our attention is on your problem. And if we can see that it's not your problem, it's like you have this learning challenge or this learning opportunity and mine fits in with that. So here we've got this learning opportunity. What steps are we going to take? And if they both know how to tap, that's really very helpful because I can tap on my issue with my learning opportunity. You can tap on yours. We can tap on one another. Does that help? Yes, thank you. You're good. welcome. Yes. OK. I feel great right now. <laughs> well, good. I have a question that. Can you all hear her? I have a question that deals okay. with more with the, um, if you want to call it the business side of it. OK. I'm in the process of moving from one state to another. and. Um, the tips on how to promote something like this without making yourself sound like you're somebody else, like a counselor, or stepping on someone's toes, and ah. those types of things. Are you familiar with the field of coaching? Yes. Okay. So that's the way to do it. Do you feel comfortable calling yourself a coach? Sure. Do you want to be a relationship coach? Oh, yeah. See, if you want to spe see, people come to us not because we do energy psychology. Right. They come to us because they have relationship issues. How we produce the result, they, they really don't care about that. They just want, you know, when they have relationship problems, they think Paul and Lane. So niching yourself is, is a really good thing to do with your business. So if you want to specialize in relationship or partnership, mm -hmm. then being a relationship or a partnership coach, is, I mean, it's worked very, very well for us. Well, I, I look at this as an opportunity to reinvent myself since I'm starting all over again. It's a great sure. opportunity. <laughs> and to go, you know, to go to networking meetings to find out what mm -hmm. the networking associations are and right. where you're moving. And I've already started that process. Great. Great. So, so, so it's really about building your public identity. Right. Well, I'm, I'm from more than 50 miles away, so I should be the expert. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Very good. That's right. Rather than the profit in your own life. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And thank you for today. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Um, I have a question, and um, I'm sure it's not an issue for anyone else here, but setting boundaries, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I came to this seminar this weekend not really knowing what setting personal boundaries are, and I kept relationships away and was a single parent for 13 years. and. So when I hear what you're saying, it's, it's wonderful and it's enlightening and everything, but I'm trying to see how personal boundaries fit into it. For instance, if mine was fidelity, and I set that boundary very clear in a relationship, and someone breaks it, one thing I hear you saying is, okay, well, that's an area I need to grow in, possibly, but mm -hmm. does that mean I grow into saying it's okay to be in? Uh, so how does that fit in, and, and do you see boundaries constantly moving, and what is your criteria? How do you tell someone to develop that set of boundaries? Very good question. We've yeah. got lots of answers about it. Um, Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> Whatever you want, dear. <laughs> I listen to Gary. Um, there's like two pieces of it. There's setting the boundary and then using uh, the breakdown or when the boundary is crossed to uh, see it as a learning opportunity. One of my boundaries is honesty. Okay, um, it, with someone that I have a close relationship with, dishonesty doesn't work for me. It really destroys trust for me rather quickly. Um, so I can tell someone, um, one of my boundaries is dishonesty and deceit. Um, if if th that happens in our relationship, I can let you know that I'll probably uh, expel you from my future. I won't want to be in relationship with you anymore because that really hurts. Um, but what is also true is that what happens in my relationships is not an accident. I participate in what happens. Any relationship is a co-creation. The way we create our relationships is by the thoughts, feelings, attitudes, behaviors that we use in that relationship. So I can say you have to be honest with me all the time because it's not okay with me that you're untruthful. But how do I handle it when you tell me something I don't like? Do I create a safe space for you to be honest? 
If you tell me something I don't like, do I become punitive? Do I become critical? So if somebody starts being dishonest with me, how have I participated in that happening? That's where we move to personal responsibility, which is one of the foundations of our teachings about how to create partnerships. The biggest price that you have to pay in becoming the conscious creator of your partnerships is you have to give up being a victim. It's a very high price for a lot of people. They don't want to do that. So I can feel victimized if somebody lies to me. Oh, poor me. You know, after all I've given to you, after all the love I gave you, you told me a lie. And I can feel sorry for myself. Well, that doesn't move me to a position of personal power. It doesn't, uh, there isn't any conversation about how I've contributed to that in a way. Which doesn't mean that I take responsibility for him lying or him being unfaithful. But what I want to do is I want to see the breakdown as a learning opportunity. If someone's unfaithful to me, if someone uh, trespasses, transgresses with a boundary uh, and I get hurt, rather than, you know, blaming them and saying, you did this to me, one of the first things I'm going to do is I'm going to look for the responsibility in my part. Is there something I can learn from this? As I take responsibility for my part and I cease to indulge my desire to blame them or uh, punish them because they crossed my boundary, my action of personal responsibility inspires theirs, okay? So once we've you know, taken responsibility for our part, hopefully, then I establish the boundary again, which is, okay, now that we've learned all there is to learn, I have to let you know again it's not okay with me that deceit exists in our relationship. I'm going to do everything on my end to be responsible for my own feelings so that I can create a safe place for you to be honest. But there are going to be times when you're afraid to be honest with me and I want to know that you're going to be honest when you're, when you're afraid to. Will you agree to that? So has Paul ever been dishonest with you? Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, sometime. and so basically it's a clarification of where your boundary lies in that honesty or why it occurred. Is that what I'm hearing? Both. Okay. 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 And it's also being clear if the boundary continues to be crossed, what are the consequences? And being willing to stand behind the consequences that you declare. Because it's an opportunity to accrue personal power, if you will. We lose personal power when we declare a boundary and we assert that there will be a consequence to its being violated and then we don't stand up for that. Then our word means nothing. And that's, and that's how people often participate in, in being victimized by people not honoring their boundaries. They don't know how to set them and maintain them or enforce them with love. A good way, a good process that you can do to get clear on boundaries is to ask yourself, because sometimes people have their boundaries set too far away and it prevents the opportunity for real intimacy. And sometimes people have their boundaries set too close and they have the experience that people are crossing their boundaries all the time. So, what am I allowing that I shouldn't in my life? What am I, what am I allowing in my life that I should not be allowing? And the other question is, what am I not allowing that I could be allowing into my life? So the question, what am I not allowing into my life that I could be, has you look at the boundaries that you might have set too far away from you. The other has you look at the boundaries that might be set too close so that you can create some distinction to know where you really want to set the boundaries in your life and in what domains of concern, like the couple that was up here. Relationship, there are many parts of a relationship. Some parts can work really great. Other parts can be problematic. So it will have you distinguish more within the relationship for appropriate boundaries. Is that helpful? Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. I was wondering, when you talk about the five stages, if it's possible for different people in the relationship to be in a different stage of a relationship, and if so, how do you deal with that? Um, usually, if one part of the um, 
the partnership is in power struggle. It uh, causes the other partner to be in power struggle. Very rarely, I'm trying to think if I've ever seen it, where one person is in cooperation and the other person is in power struggle. I don't think so. Generally, it's descriptive of the relationship. Even when you get into relationships larger than two people, like corporations or you know, small groups of people working together? Oh, when you get into, um, like, more than that, yes, then that's definitely possible. Yeah. And then where do you begin to kind of, I mean, I'm, not to explain the whole thing, but where do you begin to kind of sort that out and help people with that? Well, you want to help people take responsibility for their own personal power struggle issues. The way to navigate through power struggle is to know what are my power struggle issues? What is it that has me struggle for power? What are the fears that have me, you know, think that I have to be in control? How are the ways that I control? Do I control overtly? Do I control covertly? Am I manipulative? Do I make people feel sorry for me as a way of um, controlling? And since power struggle is the bottom line about trust, looking at the tr your trust issues also. How do I not trust people? How do I assess trustworthiness in others? And am I trustworthy myself? Being able to look at my own uh, behavior and criteria for how I conduct myself. So one of the best things you could do is like show them that piece that we have about skill development in your handout about power struggle mm -hmm. and have the person look at where do you see you have room to grow here? And where would you like to start? You know, what, if you were to learn this skill or you were to resolve this issue, you know, which one of these things would make the biggest difference in how you feel in our company? You know, what if you were to stop complaining and make requests? What if it was easier for you to know what you were feeling and to talk about that? Um, what if it was easy, you know, I mean, it's all there in the handout for you. Thanks. And that can be a very powerful conversation for a group to have that most groups don't have. They tend to operate over all of the unspoken feelings that are roiling around in a group. And if they can talk about, have this level of conversation, it really empowers the whole group and everyone in it because it contributes to a more collaborative environment. Thank you. Yes. Uh, my comment is a territorial response, uh, the kind of language that Ann talked about last night. For those that are considering uh, referring to themselves as coaches, uh, I want them to be aware that, there, that coaching is a distinct profession and there is an international um, a federation of coaching that has uh, standardized practices and, and ethics and that can be found on the web too, International Coaching Federation. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. We're members ourselves. Yes. I just have a comment, um, which I work with a lot of relationships and usually it's relationship with self yes and they end up showing themselves in different ways and you know I saw a metaphor that really made sense to me is like a, a hologram you know and each part reflects the whole and everywhere we come from wherever we come from it reflects itself in all of our relationships with ourselves, at work in our relationships with our children our spouses and when you start dealing with the inner cause, which is usually self, you heal that and then all the other parts start to heal in those other directions. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I have, most of my clients are women. You hardly ever have a man come in and usually they come in without the husband. And so what I usually have them do is I have them write a list of all the things that he does to her, or all the things wrong with him. Mm -hmm. And I call these push buttons, and so we start addressing these push buttons, and eventually they're all gone. And when they go home, they realize that their interaction with them are totally different. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I guess the whole key is what I'm trying to say is everything that we, every relationship, whether it's at home, work, or self, it's still on inside of us. And whenever, yeah. and I'm, I, someone mentioned today, so well, I don't really work with children. And I, I, most of us deal with adults. But when we start dealing with adults, we realize we're dealing with children. <laughs> because that's Definitely where it all comes so. From. That's mm -hmm. right. That's right. The but, wounded child. And just like Don and Ann, when you go to the kids and you work with those issues, those are so simple. Because when you end it right there, it don't go no further. Because each, each of our learning patterns, our relationship patterns, or our, on how we develop, and I've sat with women, like she's been married for 10 years, 
10 years three times. Mm -hmm. And each of the men end up being just like the previous one. Mm -hmm. And we go back and I say, what happened to you at 10? And she thought, oh, that's when mom got remarried and this new mean man came in my life. Mm -hmm. And we start to see in these life patterns. And then what happens, and it, it occurs all the time, is that we either become like the, the, the one who influenced us the most, mm -hmm. or we marry the one who did, or we switch roles in between marriages. Yes. That's right. Yes. Uh, in our home study course, one of the laws is the law of modeling. And it talks about how anything unresolved with our parents will come up in our other relationships. And basically in three different ways. We'll recreate the personality type of our parents. Or we will recreate the kind of relationship our parents had with each other. Or we'll recreate the kind of relationship we had with our parents. And we'll shift roles. We'll become the parent and, and our, our relationship will be like us as a child or we'll get stuck in being the child and they're like our parent. And, and usually what I see also is that home becomes stagnant and we take all the childhood issues and take it to work. There's always mm -hmm. that one person. Right, who's the learning person. opportunity. And so it's all right here. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so when you eliminate it here, wherever we go, it's not there anymore. Right. Thank you. Very great point. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Uh, do you have any guidelines uh, for an active, uh, pr the active person in a marriage who um, initiates a divorce to help the children and ex-husband uh, look at it as a growth rather than marriage is a failure, your marriage is a failure? You know what I'm talking about? Yes. The f one of the most important things that a couple with children can do who are getting a divorce is to recognize that their relationship is not ending, their partnership is not ending. It's merely changing form. And they're going to continue to be co-parents. So it's going to be critical for the children's emotional, mental, spiritual well-being that they do that, that they conduct that transition from one form to another, preserving as much dignity and respect and affinity as possible and that takes some work to do that because there are powerful negative feelings usually around the divorce so but part of it is uh, resolving the emotional issues um, the last uh, stage is completion so there's some insights that you can get clear on uh, conversations to have but uh, in in establishing a new partnership one of the most important skills is having a purpose having a clearly stated purpose. So if you were married partners, you were family, and now you're going to be co-parents, having, having a new purpose for your relationship with your ex-spouse. Okay, the purpose of our relationship is to love and support one another so that we can be the best, best parents possible. The purpose of our relationship is to uh, create an environment for our children to grow in safety and support. So you reestablish a purpose for your relationship that focuses your energy. You become aligned for a common good. You are as invested in that purpose as they are. So rather than fighting one another, you're united again. And so a lot of times you're willing to put aside a lot of the the petty little things because you can see that there's a higher purpose that it would be much better if you could just cooperate and not bicker so that you can both be there for your daughter's graduation or whatever it is. Does that help? Okay. Thank you. Great question. I'm a divorce lawyer. Good. And uh, <laughs> don't ask me what I'm doing here. Uh, <laughs> what are well, you doing here? Well, I'm, I'm doing EFT also, and I use it in my divorce work a lot of times. Great. Wow. Um, yes. Wow. But what I come across is uh, something other than what you just said, which mm -hmm. is it sounds like you've just changed the agreement from being together to support one another and the children to one of being apart and being co-parents to still support those children. That's not my experience. My experience is that usually the person who has gone for the divorce mm -hmm. would feel that way perfectly. Mm -hmm. The other person is usually finding certain ways, the th slings and arrows, 
any way they can to use those children as pawns to get back at that person. Mm -hmm. Now my concern is, I think one of the questions that, that I, I got from that question was how do I as that, or how does that, how do I advise that person uh, who is the movement, the moving party mm -hmm. for the divorce, to still nonetheless maintain their center, perhaps like Joe, to be able to forgive and all that kind of thing, but when you still have that aggravant always at you, always going to try to upset the apple cart, to try to disturb the situation, H how do you accomplish that? Is it the same as, I mean, what occurs to me as I'm saying this is the same as Joe, right. but I don't know any other way. Is there any other way that you can come up with? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's it. And it takes both parties being willing to participate. And a lot of our work, if it's a, if it's a particularly rancorous divorce, separation, it can take a lot of work getting both parties through whatever stuff is causing that so that they can be more responsible as, as parents. So it's easy to say the words that we just said to you. The accomplishment of that process is another matter altogether. Well, yeah, just because you were in power struggle as, as uh, marriage partners doesn't mean that you're going to somehow become cooperative in co-parenting. If you're power struggling as, as mates, you're gonna, you'll, you'll still be in power struggle because you haven't learned the learning opportunities and you haven't taken responsibility and you haven't used the relationship to grow. One of the things that when people come to us and they feel like they're at the end of their rope and they're really considering divorce, um, we say, well, yes, divorce is always an option, but you need to earn your way out of it by learning how you created it. Otherwise, you'll just go recreate it again. You know, one of the things that we, we human beings do unconsciously, often when we want to complete a relationship, is we'll create a reason to be angry or upset to justify completing the relationship. And so we'll use that kind of energy to blame the other person or manufacture a story for which we may even have a lot of evidence to justify our, our actions. And one of the things that you have demonstrated is, and that we teach, is how to complete in love. And one of the ways that we describe the energy of love, and if you look into your own experience, you may see that this is true for you. And I'm not talking about romantic love or sentimental love. I'm talking about the energy of love is that energy which both simultaneously binds things together and separates them, causing them to be distinct, like the mortar between bricks on a brick wall. It is the mortar that holds the whole thing together and also provides each individual brick its place within that field. We have the ability to use love to move people off of our path so that, so that you can both acknowledge what was so and that this is what's so now and that this is what's appropriate and without a loss of love. It's just like you add more mortar between the brick that's you and the brick that's them, but it's done with love. And we can bring people circumstances, conditions into our life in the same way. So, just wanted to share that. You may have to do a lot of tapping before you're able to do that, but good, thank you. Does that you. make sense about tapping. energy of love working like that? Yes, you've been waiting. It's okay. Um, this is a work-related question. I, was, I do a lot of work with teenagers and parents or elementary age children and parents, and I was wondering I, I'm, if the stages are different or, or if they're not different, are there specific things that change in the approach because the parent actually does have responsibilities over the child and the dynamics aren't the same? And what, and what do you, you know, how do you start, do you start differently or what kinds of different questions do you ask or things like that? We have not worked with uh, teens and parents that much. We've worked with uh, married couples who deal with their teen issue. So I can only speculate how I might work with them. Um, 
one of the things that I would want to see is that a lot of times people work out as parents we work out our unresolved childhood issue with our with our children we um, we become like automatically the way our mother or our father was with us that we hated so I you know I educate the parent uh, about what their unresolved emotional issues are that cause them to make choices that that are not helpful my and my thought about that would be that I would do some of that or most of that separate for, and not have the child in the room at the time yes but afterwards they the parent could come in and take responsibility and say I oh you know what I learned this from my mom and I'm not I'm gonna change it now or whatever but I don't you know I still think boundary wise that the child a 10 year old doesn't need to know the whole history no absolutely. absolutely that's a wise choice yeah okay. thank you thank you yes Miriam I'm feeling an incredible sense of gratitude and the gratitude is that, and I'm just curious about this too. Closer. It seems like, to me, that whatever boundary I create is actually a red flag pointing to the unhealed parts of myself. And that, I mean, that's what I've heard in the sharings, every sharing this morning, and uh -huh. it was just like, Oh, that makes it very easy. Uh huh. <laughs> Thank you. Which doesn't mean that you shouldn't have boundaries. Yeah, well, so what is the difference between the boundary that comes from the unconscious, unhealed parts, which per presumably do not support a loving, open, free, heart connected space, mm -hmm. and the ones that are, what, what makes one real and the other? A lesson. That's the question. I, I think for, I think it's the capacity to use the violation of boundaries to look at what you're talking about. What does this mean about me? What is the opportunity for me to heal in the violation of this boundary? And is it appropriate for me to change it or not? Or do I want to maintain it? Because I have choice. It's my life and I can have it the way that I want it. So it's how you look at the opportunity that the violation represents, right. if you even look at it like that. Oh, and there's another piece to it. <laughs> if we have these boundaries, mm -hmm. what we put our thought to or our attention on actually draws it to us. Does it not actually accelerate the learning? Whether it's a conscious boundary or whether it's just that fear place within oneself that said, I mean, for me, it's like infidelity. I mean, you know, it's, it's like that's, that's a big red flag for me. Well, I can tell you how I think about it because there's another piece that I would add to this. Yeah. Um, see, relationships are not just for learning and healing. Uh, the superior reason that we're in relationship from a soul perspective is to create together. We are here to create and to observe our creations. That's why we want this three-dimensional piece, you know. Um, so if, um, if I set a boundary, uh, let's say, um, uh, a fidelity, okay, and my father had cheated on my mother, you know, and it was really painful, and so my rule is absolutely no fidelity, I don't want you flirting with w women, I don't even want you to tell them that they're beautiful, because that hurts my feelings, okay, so I don't want you to be attracted to women and absolutely no sexual touching, okay, so that's my boundary. So, uh, if he were to transgress, or I were to imagine that he were to transgress, that's going to activate my unresolved father stuff. And so I can use that as a healing opportunity. Okay, so once I use that as a healing opportunity, well, what's true about what we want to create? You and I are creating, you know, education about partnership, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know that I would choose to create, to have, a partnership with you about relationship education if you were also being sexual with other women. See, that's a choice point for me, and it's a choice not from fear, but out of clarity about what I want to create. Good. That that's helps. how I think about it. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. We have five uh, minutes. Okay, we're coming up on the end of our, our time here. This is the last five minutes. Um, 
I guess one of the things that I would want to say in uh, closing is uh, my sense of everybody in this room is that we're all pioneers. We are conducting a grand experiment and um, it's important for you to to say to, to maintain a real clear connection with your spiritual source so that you can be guided because I think that there your calling your individual calling fits into a grander scheme and it allows you to uh, serve people from a much higher place so if you are, you know you're going to be d helping people with relationships take care of your relationship with yourself take care of your relationship with a higher power make sure that uh, you're filled with the spirit make sure that your needs are satisfied that you haven't made the error of being a, a compulsive caregiver that you know how to set boundaries uh, that it's okay to say no to people who are in need just because someone is in need doesn't mean that their needs are more important than your needs and even if it looks like it and one of the things I mean we train people how to do the work that we do and I can see that there's like this epidemic of people who are attracted to this work the caregiver mentality they don't always have very clear boundaries and they don't know how to say no in love to someone who's in need and I consider that to be um, the arrogance of the ego when we think that we are the only solution to someone's problem though you are wizards you know in a certain way and you have skills that are unusual you are not the only channel that spirit will use to facilitate the healing for this person so you don't have to you know deny yourself or hurt yourself or sacrifice yourself uh, in order to heal and I say that out of my hard-earned you know experience because I did that for so many years and that's how I got burned out it's why I had to take a four and a half year vacation um, maybe that's why it's important for me to tell you that maybe you already know that and I'm just talking to myself <laughs> I want to complete by thanking you for the opportunity to address you uh, to listen to you and to interact with you is, is our deep privilege to be here and to be a part of this um, august gathering and we want to thank Gary for inviting us and for including us here thank you thank very you much. all very much